So very good afternoon to everyone. I welcome you all, the distinguished guests, back to the session after uh, some symptoms of meals for our stomach. Let us start off the this session and get up the seat belts, fasten your seat, be seat belts for a drive to the vascular neurology. So I would like to invite the chairpersons for this session. Dr. Rajiv Anand, currently stationed at uh, BLK Super Specialty Hospital, Saket. Dr. Bhavna Sharma, Senior Professor and Head of Neurology, SMS Jaipur. Dr. Pushkar Gupta, currently stationed at direct, as a Director and neuro, uh, Head of Neurology in Rukmini Brilla Hospital, Jaipur. Okay, so I would request our chairpersons to invite our speakers for the respective sessions. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this post-lunch session on vascular neurology. We shall have four eminent speakers in this session. Dr. Subhash Kaul needs no introduction. He'll be the first speaker in this session. He is MBBS, MD, DM from PGI Chandigarh. And he was associated with NIMS Hyderabad. He joined as assistant professor and later became head of the department. He has almost 120 publications to his credit and he holds many awards. State Teachers Award, Past President Andhra Pradesh Neurosciences Association, Past President Indian Stroke Association, and Past President Indian Academy of Neurology. Let me have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Subhash Kaul. Can we have the slide, sir? Uh, thank you, uh, respected chairpersons, Dr. Bhavana. Uh, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Arun Garg for this immaculate conference in your own style where everything is just immaculate, perfect, in spite of the rescheduling of the flights and all, still as if nothing has happened. So thank you very much. We have to all learn from you. Uh, practical approach to stroke in young. Now young is a very broad term. It also includes stroke in infants, children and young adults. But we'll not talk about infants and children because that is an absolutely different ball game. Perinatal stroke is different. They are related to the pregnancy, they are related to the infections, uh, hemorrhages in the brain, and we are not talking of that. But children and young adults, particularly older children, that becomes a spectrum. And these young strokes are on rise in India, and in fact, all over the world. And in India, this young stroke segment, which is predominantly 15 to 45, it has increased in the last 10 years or so. And I'm sure that must be your experience in your wards. There'll be a lot of people in this 25, 30, 35 age group. Now, in this group, compared to the older adults, we have to be very cautious before we make a diagnosis of stroke. We have to rule out tumors and other structural brain lesions, post-ictal palsies, complicated migraine, familial alternating hemiplegia, press, which all of us see, intracranial infections, drug toxicity, post-infectious cerebellitis, and most important, psychogenic conditions, because adolescence is a time when people are stressed and they can sometimes somatize into a stroke. So therefore, there should be a very important checklist before we finally diagnose it as a young stroke. The investigations, basic investigations for diagnosis of stroke are same as in older adults by CT scan and MRI. And again, like in older adults, overall 80% are ischemic and 20% are hemorrhagic. Now, since we are talking mainly from 15 to 45 age group, between 15 and 30 years of age, we must make every effort to rule out the genetic cause of stroke, the cardiac cause, the vasculitis, the infection-related strokes. And as the young adult crosses the age of 30, he starts getting premature atherosclerosis, plus all the above causes. So you cannot draw a definite line, but you have to have a broad picture in your mind. Simultaneously, we have to multitask our brain to make sure that we are not missing any treatable disease, curable disease in these patients of young stroke. So the quick checklist, whenever you see a young stroke, and again, I'm saying by young, I mean between 50 to 15 to 45 age group, ask him about migraine aura, history of seizures, family history, past history of stroking, check his peripheral pulses, you know, skin examination, retinal examination, 
we have doctors have neurologists have forgotten to use stetho but all strokes which should palpate and as auscultate for any murmurs hypertension diabetes smoking alcohol and drugs so all this checklist we should have in a patient of young stroke so it makes sense to uh, when you think of the etiology uh, divide it into a b and c a stands for arteriopathies b is for blood or hematology and c is for cardiac etiology and we must make sure that we have ruled out diseases in all of them so the first in this age group we should consider non atheromatous arteriopathies so most important and common cause frequency wise is arterial dissection 20 years back we used to think it is uncommon in fact this is the most common it's just that we didn't know how to pick it up we didn't know how to suspect with good neuroradiology we are seeing there are too many arterial dissections extracranial as well as intracranial so we should not miss it and as you know in arterial dissection there is a tear in the endothelium of the intima of the artery which causes double lumen and this double lumen is seen here as a semi lunar shape in the transverse fat sat images so in young strokes always and always rule out dissection now uh, definite or probable trauma is the cause in some cases almost 50% but in other 50% dissection can be spontaneous this is because they may be having some connective tissue abnormality like ehrler danlos syndrome marfan syndrome but even unspecified connective tissue abnormality in the endothelium can lead to arterial dissection there can be other arterial abnormalities also like fibromuscular dysplasia archer torchusti syndrome which may make a person prone to dissection or lead to stroke on their own but we should remember arterial dissection never to be missed because many times they may need stenting also although most of the times they do not the second very important cause which we are commonly seeing again and again and were missing previously is moya moya disease or moya moya syndrome disease when it's idiopathic syndrome when there's an underlying cause there's a progressive stenosis of the terminal ica and formation of collateral vessels that's why it's called puff of, it's called moya moya because in japanese moya moya means puff of smoke which are because of collaterals now before they get stroke these patients if you take their history they have history of migraine they have history of headache they have history of seizures tia so therefore it's very important whenever any child or adolescent comes with this rule out moya moya and uh, it has to be revascularized i have seen patients where we took it little casually patients had second third stroke and finally became vegetative so therefore this is class 1 recommendation that moya moya has to be revascularized first of all we have to pick it up and these are again the pictures and you can see here so much of revascularization and you usually they get deep basal ganglionic infarcts takayashu's disease should never miss it and clinically you will suspect it when you will find asymmetry of the radial pulses so it's a, and particularly if the patient is young in this there is a inflammation at the mouth of the arteries at the aortic arch it's a immunological disease they have to be given immunological therapy including rituximab these days and if they ha still have symptoms they may have to be stented we have stented many few of them okay now vasculitis is important to know in young strokes one is secondary vasculitis which is very common in sle or in bechet's disease or any of the vasculitis you can have secondary stroke but in young people it's also important to uh, bear in mind that you can have bacterial and viral infective vasculitis and the most important as all of you know is chickenpox or varicella vasculitis and many times young people present just with tia recurrent tia and in spite of our aspirin and uh, clopidogrel their attacks seem to be coming again and again and if we don't suspect it we'll never pick it up many times they don't have even a history of uh, rash on the skin sometimes they have but many times they don't have so in any young person who is getting recurrent tia or even one stroke and doesn't have other risk factors we must do a csf examination and send send it for biofire which includes many infections including varicella i have recently seen a varicella and so which which was thought as a idiopathic vasculitis and she was treated with steroids for a long time which is wrong they just need two weeks of acyclovir so always in young stroke keep in mind varicella vasculitis but there is also a concept of focal cerebral arteriopathy where you find in a young man for 
you know, without any reason, there's a focal cerebral arteriopathy. We are recognizing it more and more, and there's a lot of literature on this. We don't know what is the cause of it, but it is thought that these are also probably post-viral. The model is chickenpox model, but some other viruses. So focal cerebral, I'm sure all of you see this patient having just in the MCA, at the beginning of the MCA, just some stenotic lesions. Now, this is the era of vessel wall imaging. And in, uh, let us say, there's a young man of 25 years, and he comes with a stroke. And on the MRA, you find that there is a, ves there is a vessel wall involvement. There's an irregularity of the vessel, or there's a complete tight stenosis. So there are three important causes in the young person. One can be, it can be this focal cerebral vasculitis, what I said, focal vasculitis. Second is it can be premature atherosclerosis also. Hypertension is very common. 20% of the matriculate people were found to be hypertensives in Bombay. And third is it can be moya moya. So therefore in this you can do vessel wall imaging. It's also called black blood imaging. This is very good in which you look for the patterns of enhancement. For instance, if it is a uh, vasculitis, there'll be a concentric enhancement. As you can see in this lower picture, there's a concentric, which means the whole of the vessel wall, like a rounded thing, like a halo, it's all enhancing. This is suggestive of a vasculitis. On the other hand, if it's a atherosclerosis, the enhancement is eccentric. Only half of it, as you can see in this picture. There's only eccentric, there's only on one side. And this enhancement is seen very beautifully against the background of black blood. That's why it's called black blood imaging. So in all young strokes where we are not sure of the etiology, we should do this black blood imaging or what's also called vessel wall imaging that is helps us to delineate what is the cause of the uh, arteriopathy. Now the other thing is genetic strokes. Now, genetic strokes can be monogenic or polygenic. In older adults, they are polygenic. There are 10, 10 genetic associations which take place, hypertension, diabetes, so on and so forth. But in young people, just the abnormality in one gene can create a havoc with the muscles. And the most important is in this, uh, as we will go, they can be of various uh, types. They can be autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-linked, and mitochondrial. But the most important is cadacil which you can see the first two pictures here. You can see the small vessel uh, hyper intensities here, and particularly we have to look at the external capsule. Here the external capsule is important, not the internal capsule, which is outside the basal ganglia, just near this sylvian fissure, the external capsule. And you should also look at the temporal lobes, subcortical temporal lobes. This is the signature of the cadacil. Very important cause of young stroke who also have migraine headaches and seizures and all and so, dementia also. And there's also associated condition called caracil, in which there will not be any family history, but they're usually bald. Phenotypically, they are bald and they also have stroke. And then another very important thing, which is a newly learned in the last few years, it's called coal 4 a one mutation. Believe me, it's common if we look for it. This is just a younger version of amyloid angiopathy. When an elderly person gets small vessel diseases, non atherosclerosis we say he's got an amyloid angiopathy. Same thing when it happens in a young person, 20, 25, 30, who comes with ischemic stroke. You do this MRI, and if you find a lot of small vessel changes along with calcifications, along with cysts, this is called for, for one a mutation. You can prove it genetically by doing the whole exam sequencing, but it's very important to realize. And then the important thing is Febreze disease. Febrile disease is, it also causes small vessel disease of the brain. It's because of deficiency of the enzyme galactosidase A because of a mutation. In this, because of this deficiency, there's accumulation of the trihexoceramide in the blood vessels, tissues, organs. And this is, I have seen only one febrile disease in my life. I'm sure senior people may have seen more, but I was very happy. Recently, I was in one conference in Udaipur, in stroke conference, I asked many senior people, they had not seen even one patient. I felt very happy. But I have seen one patient of febrile disease. He's from Bangalore. And you can see this angiokeratoma, which are all over his body, these small, small. This is actually accumulation of that lipid in his skin. And again, as you can see, there are these hyperintensity, small vessel disease. And he underwent enzyme estimation in Bangalore itself. And they have shown there is a very much significantly decreased galactosidase levels 
in the leukocytes. It also favors causes kidney disease, kidney failure. Sometimes they undergo renal transplantation also. So very important disease. And another important thing is that there is an enzyme replacement therapy available, which is very prohibitively expensive as of now. But even without the replacement therapy, also attention to the blood pressure and other things can carry these patients quite long. MELAS, we can never forget about it. MELAS actually is not a vascular stroke at all. It's a metabolic stroke. And the signature of MELAS is, we should never forget about this, which you can see posteriorly, this uh, occipital uh, parietal hyperintensity. It is only cortical like this ho hockey stick. So this is the, if a patient comes with recurrent attacks and he has a picture like this, it is MELAS. And these days by genetics, you can find the, uh, you know, uh, the proof of the thing. But most important thing is, even now, in these people from 30 years to 45 years, if you see the prevalence, it is still atherosclerosis, premature atherosclerosis, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, obesity. Just because patient is 30 years doesn't mean he can't have it. It's very common. And this is because of the faulty lifestyle, alcohol, tobacco, oral contraceptives. Particularly if you have got a migraine background, you are sure to have a stroke. This is one medical student. I, I used to give stroke in young talks. I never put drugs in that. I thought this is something which happens in Baltimore or something. It's not our phenomena. Till one day I got this particular patient. He's a medical student. He had a stroke, as you can see here, and there's some evidence of previous stroke also. And there's no, nothing else, and his parents were sitting with him. So I asked him as a joke. I said, uh, you don't smoke. And the father said, yes. So. I didn't say anything. Then I said, just as a joke, I said, but at least you are not on drugs. Father said, no, he is. Now, this was my first case. And I was, believe me, now I'm not shocked. After that, I have seen many patients. And this is from a respectable family. I asked him, what drugs do you take? He took out his mobile and showed me this. And I took a picture of this. It says, cocaine in Goa, alcohol, regular. He said, medical student, MDMA. First time I heard this, MDMA, looks like an anesthesia degree. Weed regular, LSD. So, sir, drugs are there. We don't know them. Our own people may be having them. So, so, so they are there. After that, I have found few more patients also. Now, that was arteriopathies, right? Vasculitis and vasculopathy. Now, second, we come to B part of it, that is blood. So, sickle cell disease. This morning, I'm coming from Vishakhapatnam. Right, uh, we had a meeting there, neurology meeting. There's a belt there, Arku Valley, where sickle cell is very common. And in fact, we thought that we'll do a study on that. So sickle cell disease, 300 times higher prevalence of stroke than in children without sickle cell disease, number one. Antiphospholipid antibody, you never forget about it. In all young people, we should do all the three components of antiphospholipid. We need to give a very nice lecture recently. Polycythemia, very common, secondary polycythemia. Look for it. They may be 17, 18. And of course, sometimes leukemia or something can present as a stroke for the first time. Hyperhomocystemia, we all see it's common, but there's not much uh, certainty about it. But one thing I want to say that we routinely send factor 5 lead-in protein, C protein, as the literature says that these risk factors are only important in infants or small children, that also for venous stroke. For arterial stroke, they are not such a big players, even though we send for it. So that is blood. Now we finally come to cardiac. Cardiac is where the money is. Always we should rule for mitral stenosis, even though rheumatic heart disease is less, but it is not out still. Atrial fibrillation with mitral stenosis, prosthetic cardiac valve, recent myocardial infarction, young myocardial infarction, patent for an OL is very important because now we can intervene in some cases and close the OL. Atrial myxoma and fibroelastoma. Always in young strokes, we should do an echo. They will tell you on some, veg they will tell you there is a, uh, th there is some kind of a small mass on the leaflet. Now this can be vegetation also, this can be thrombus also, this can be tumor also. It just looks like that. And we have done it, we have done their surgeries also, and they are all right, and they don't need any aspirin after that. But we have to think of it. See, all this we learned in last few years. Fibroelastoma, myxoma, they are very much there, particularly in the young people. And if, a, if any person is with fever, 
rule out infective endocarditis. Fever plus murmur is the old wisdom. This is one of the patients who came with triparesis, our own patients, and there was a murmur and we found there were infective endocarditis. Only on TEE we could find it. And this was published also as usual. Again, one young woman, one of my patients who came with, hardly, she was not even married. During one function, she suddenly had a vision of loss on one side, past history of migraine, and we found there's a hyperintensity in the occipital area, and she found out to have a patent foramen oval on TEE with right to left shunt. And this is important. And some of them, that's a separate topic, some of PFOs, few of them, not most of them, few of them may need a closure if we are very sure that the stroke is because of PFO, because of a rope score. Again, I'm reminded of Vinit, because last week he gave us such a nice lecture on that. Then you can have because of carditis, myocarditis, and all that thing. And COVID strokes, everybody knows recently. I think we'll not talk about it. It involved many young people. Large vessels were involved. They were just because of that immunological cytokine storm and all, and they, were, they had no other risk factors. So these days we have to rule out COVID also when you have an unexplained stroke in a young man. Now, how do you manage acute ischemic stroke in young? Now, if a patient is more than 18 years, just treat him like an adult with the TP and everything. Even if he's 15 or 16, still you can give it, but you have to take a consent and all. Because 15 and 18, what is the difference? But if he's a seven year old, there is no data that we should thrombolize him. Right, so that those concepts we have to have. Otherwise, just close observation. Some people may need intubation, oxygenation, etc. And most important thing in young stroke is to prevent the recurrence. So if it is Takayashu, steroids and revascularization in some. If it is Moya Moya, aspirin and revascularization, very important. If it's dissection, antiplatelets or anticoagulants, only for three months. After that, you need not give. But most of us still give it. That's a different thing for some insecurity, but otherwise it's not required. Vasculitis, steroids, and these days rituximab, uh, you know, on, on the long-term basis. Sickle cell disease, exchange transfusions. And TCD, probably this is one place where TCD is important. You monitor, you know, by TCD and exchange transfusion. Cardioembolic anticoagulation and Mela's mitochondrial cocktail. So that was ischemic. Now, as far as hemorrhage is concerned, in my experience in young strokes, still hypertension is common and it is de novo hypertension. The, the typical scenario, 30-year-old man comes with a brain hemorrhage. History of hypertension? No. But you do the ECG, there's always a L, LVH. You know, so therefore hypertension is very important and we should start checking, as per the guidelines also from the age of 18, we should start checking for hypertension. Otherwise, it will come first time as a uh, brain hemorrhage after 10 years. And then AV malformations, cavernomas, aneurysms, we should also think about that. And never forget CVT uh, in young. And uh, we are going to have a session on rehabilitation. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to attend that. I'm very excited about it because rehabilitation is very important, but it is particularly important for the young people. Because many of them are computer professionals. They have a whole life in front of them. Some of them cannot write, they cannot type. And now there are new techniques in rehabilitation. It's amazing what kind of therapies we have now. Physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, cognitive therapy, but there are robotics now. There are new, there's an artificial arm, there's artificial leg, computer-driven technology. That's a world in itself, and I think all of us should attend that after this session. So friends, in summary, brain strokes are increasing in young adults. In young adults, we must rule out genetic, inflammatory, and cardiac causes, which are specific to that age group. But hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and smoking remain the risk factors, except in kids. I'm not talking of kids. They're there. Urgent treatment is same as in older adults and prevention depends on the cause of stroke. Thank you very much. Any questions? Tuberous sclerosis with the intracardiac phacomas. 
I have a follow up over a period of the last 42 years but I haven't seen even a single patient developing any embolic manifestation is there any specific reason with the embolic manifestation even though they have the intracardiac phacoma we are more worried about left atrial myxoma but what about this yeah, fact? I have not seen, yeah. I have not read also. Maybe uh, any of Strangely, <laughs> strangely, they don't present with any embolic manifestation. You mean there are tubers within the heart? Yeah, the, exactly. Thank you. They tend to desert yeah, over a period. We need maybe. It's always a pleasure to hear you. Uh, the only issue is the dose of the thrombolysis. You know, because when we talk to pediatric neurologists, they are routinely using, there are no guidelines, but they all say we tend to use the 0.6 milligram per kilogram. So, when you were uh, reviewing, did you find any any guideline? Because I think it's only expert evidence. There's, but they tend to use the 0.6. The in the pediatric age group, they don't use the 0.9. Okay. Okay. What is the lowest stage uh, at which you can thrombolyze uh, in medical? See the if you look at the guidelines, it's 18 and above. Yeah. So 18 and below is not guideline, but out of um, uh, you know, uh, you you can thrombolyze these patients from uh, expert evidence. So you can have thrombolyze at any level because below 18, whether it's seven or six or 10, it doesn't make a difference. But the dose that the pediatric neurologists tend to use is the 0.6. So and that is only by expert evidence. It's, there's no guideline. It's not like a class A evidence or a class B. It's a BR evidence. So. Yeah. 0.6 you can use at whatever age. The only issue happens that sometimes we have infected. So you have a 25 year old tubercular meningitis admitted in the hospital and develops a stroke. Now that becomes an issue whether a infected vasculitis we should thrombolize. No, that is true because infective vasculitis, particularly during COVID time, there are mucormycosis and they are NGO invasive and thrombolizing them can be disastrous. So probably one should avoid. Uh, Vinit, another tubercular. thing, another thing is uh, while reviewing, I found that. Uh, Low molecular weight heparin has been mentioned for uh, stroke in children, not in, there it is mentioned, although in adults it has no role at all. So, and one more thing, uh, now with premature atherosclerosis, and if you find a PFO, so at what rope score should we advise closure of PFO? See, it's not only the rope score that you will look at, so it's basically if you have a non-lacunar stroke, which means it's not a small artery disease, the patient is between 18 and 60 years of age, and there is no other cause that you identify. So that, then you look at the rope score. So rope score alone is not, because rope score includes uh, absence of hypertension, yes, absence. Correct. So basically what you look at when you have to close a PFO is 18 to 60 years of age, no other cause, yes. non-lacunar uh, stroke, and, uh, and if, if the PFO is complicated. Yeah. If it's a simple Only, PFO, yeah. you don't. There are clinical criteria, there are echocardiographic yes. criteria. Okay. That is a different topic altogether. So we can have rest of the discussion. After okay, the okay. Th thank you. Th thank you, sir. Very, very thank you. Now we are inviting the second speaker of the post lunch session, Dr. Jayant Rai. Dr. Jayant Rai is the director of the stroke program and senior consultant in the Neurology Institute of the Neuroscience in Kolkata. He is the MD and DM and fellow of cerebral vascular disorder from the Canada. He has the 40 publication in the peer journal view and uh, he is awardee of the William McKinney from the American Society of Neuro Neuroimaging. Sir, continue some. Uh, thank you, Chairpersons. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my topic is IVT beyond guidelines and challenging cases. Take the bull by the horn. That is the tagline. They call it in the marketing parlance these days. And my good friend, Dr. Arun Garg, wanted me to do this when he preferred to watch from the gallery. Well, thinking outside the box is exciting. And those who can succeed, they are appreciated. And we always, I mean, appreciate those people who can do that. But we have to exercise caution. It is always a fine balance when you go outside the box and do something because that is the art of medicine. Well, this is exactly this issue was addressed by this editorial in Stroke Journal. What is the outer limits of reperfusion therapy? Now, RCTs are limited by picking up patients who are select, the cherry pick patients. So applying that data on a large population is sometimes difficult. And 
that is called the generalizability gap. So that limited our uh, application of stroke treatment, especially intravenous thrombolysis, when it was introduced 25 years back. We had stringent criteria. Now, over the last two decades or so, it has been revised, it has been liberalized. And now, these guidelines, recent guidelines, they have been quite, I would say, uh, liberal, and they allow a lot of uh, areas where we can thrombolize by, with cautions. It's not that we have robust evidence in everything, but we have enough experience to say that those are the areas now we can safely thrombolize where the benefit outweighs the risk. No, I'm not going to uh, read the age and every line of this indication is contraindications for you. It is available to everyone, you know that. I'm just going to highlight a few, and based on that, I'll show you some interesting cases which have been, uh, we treated long back when these guidelines were not liberalized, when these newer treatments were not available. For example, this mild stroke. Earlier the days in the mild stroke, we are in a dilemma, long back, whether we should thrombolize the patient or not. But now the guidelines have clearly showed that it is beneficial to draw, treat those patients who are uh, mild, having mild disabilities. Similarly, additional recommendations, like patients who are wake up stroke. Patients who are waking up with a stroke and the last scene well is more than 4.5 hours, based on the wake up data, it is clearly mentioned that those group, if they are selected by diffusion flare mismatch, they can be benefited by intravenous therapy. I'll show you a case. This case was done way back in 2008. 60 years old lady, hypertension, she, seven o'clock, had a left hemiplegia, came to the hospital after five hours with NIH 17. And this was the diffusion uh, restriction. We could not manage a good flare at that time because the patient was moving. So I don't have the flare image right here, but we can manage a quick MR angio showing the right ICA was not visualized. So we had clinical diffusion mismatch in this case. So we went ahead with this concept of clinical diffusion mismatch beyond the time window of 4.5 hours, we, and we gave her IVTPA. And then we took her to the cath lab. ICA was occluded. Remember, this is 2008. There was no sense to retriever, no prenumbra, not even Marcy with, with us at that point of time. But my interventionist friend was very courageous, Dr. Shukal and Purkastha. So we decided to try it. So he negotiated that with the guiding catheter, and there was a tight stenosis over there. So we decided to angioplasty that, to go upstairs. We tried an angioplasty, partially successful we were there. I do not know whether I will again try that at 2022, but we did it in 2008. So the clot moved upwards and went into the carotid T. And we had only one option of giving IATPA those days. So he gave the patient IATPA on the top of that. The result on the table was not very good, so we are not very hopeful about the outcome. But we brought the patient down from the cath lab to the MR suite again and did another DWI. And it was still holding. Much of the right MCO is still viable. We did an MR angio and the vessel was open. Maybe the IVTPA did that, we could don't know. But the next day, the patient started improving. And by three days, her power started coming back. And after seven days, the patient went home. So this is uh, the concept of clinical diffusion mismatch, which is probably the clinical, I mean, the um, uh, diffusion flare mismatch paradigm we use these days. The another point is, in the recent guideline, is about the minor stroke. In the minor stroke, they have clearly mentioned that if this is under three hours or three to 4.5 hours in both the windows, giving TPA is a reasonable option. It's not that we should not treat them. 
But here again, you exercise caution because the data have shown in, in, in other publications that it might increase the risk of symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhage and the benefit is marginal. Some meta-analyses also have shown that it is the, the outcome is almost comparable between the treated group and the untreated group. But if the minor stroke is with LVO, then the game changes. If you look at the seats ISTR data, it is seen that patients who has got a minor stroke and LVO, and they are treated either IVT or endovascular therapy, in both the groups, they get benefited. So minor stroke with LVO is a different ballgame. My second case, this is a recent case, not an archival. 58 male patient, diabetic, hypertensive, post PTCA, was on dual antiplatelet, though he has paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, already known, but was on dual antiplatelet, the reason not known to me. Presented with left hemiparesis, onset at 8 o'clock, came to the hospital pretty quick, within two hours. NIH was four, minor stroke. CT looks good. We did a CTA. The CTA looks one of those M2 branches were, was occluded. This is the first phase of CTA because we do multi-phase CTA in our center. This is the second phase, the early venous phase. And this is the late venous phase, which shows the collaterals are pretty good. And you know, in the multi-phase CTA, when you do the three phases, and you classify them into poor collateral, intermediate collateral, and good collateral, when the affected side has got an equal collateral compared to the normal side, we call them good collateral. According to that, this patient has got a very good collateral. So probably that is holding the hemisphere despite having an occlusion. So minor stroke with LVO, less than 4.5 hours, good collaterals. So we decided to treat him with IVTPA. And this is the MR next day. The patient did well. So minor stroke, LVO, we have to be careful. We should take a decision in the proper context. And the next day, MR shows the M2 was open. So the TPA did the trick. Now coming to the contraindications. Contraindications again, in the long list, but I like to mention one thing, that is CT. When we assess an acute stroke patient based on a non-contrast CT, when we should exclude them. We know that a clear hypodensity, uh, more than one third of the MC territory, we, that is the ECAS criteria, we follow that, we exclude them. But what about the early changes of CT as we see in aspects? My third case, 76 years male patient, hypertension, atrial fibrillation, was on Eliquis 2.5 twice, but uh, not sure if he has missed the drug. Last known well at five o'clock when he went to the washroom, as per the history from the wife, 6.30 found hemiplegic on the bed. Came to the hospital at 7.30, pretty quick. And the hospital did a CT. It's not my hospital though. The CT looks pretty good. So CT was done by eight o'clock in the morning. But patient didn't get IVTPA. The reason is it was not a stroke ready hospital. So what they did, they spent another one hour to get an MRI done. Uh, this is the MRI with a big restricted diffusion. There might be some early flare changes, not sure, but the right ICA was not visible. So there might be an ICA occlusion somewhere downstream. Then the patient was transferred to our center after the MRI. When they reached the hospital, it's almost close to 4.5 hours. NIH is 17. We could have given IVTP to this patient based on the first CT scan. But there was almost good two and a half hours elapsed. So we decided to do another CT. And a second point was the patient was on, Eli on Epixaban, and we do not know when the last dose was taken. Nobody can tell for sure. So we repeated the CT. And I think you can probably appreciate, I have changed the window as per the aspects. 
And now you can probably appreciate better that the patient has got a low aspect score. So low aspect score, four and a half hours, Eliquis plus minus, so we did not give IVTP to this patient. And the interventionist, again, did, did, did not want to go for uh, thrombectomy because of the very low aspect score. So based on the low aspects, we excluded the patient. And we know that there are some data that lower aspect have, may have a higher chances of symptomatic bleed and the outcome is not as good as the patients with a higher aspect score. So after four, two weeks, this is the CT looks like for this patient. He maintained well uh, neurologically, though some chest tissues because of the COPD, whatever. So this is my last case. Again, historical case, 2007. So please look at that in that perspective. I was trying to say how we tried to take the bull by the horn then, not now, because I was young at that time. 72 years lady, hypertensive ischemic heart disease, one TIA, lasted for 15 minutes, went to a local hospital, they did a CT, which was normal, gave aspirin and sent her home. After 18 hours, patient again became right hemiplegic. Then the patient came to our hospital. And by this time she reached hospital, she again improved. In age was three. And this is the CT. And if you see here, there is hypodensity. We do not know whether that was there earlier or this is a recent change. So by this time, uh, when we try to do a CT angio, there was some concern about uh, uh, contrast allergy, someone mentioned. So we backed off and we prepared for an MR. And by this time, the MR was being prepared. We did a quick TCD. And this TCD shows when we insonated the left MCA, there is a high resistance flow in the MCA with very low flow. So MCA is not happy. And then we looked at the ACA. There is a high flow in the ACA. So high flow in the ACA, low flow in the MCA, that means the blood is being diverted through the ACA because the ACA velocity is not never above MCA. So if you have a higher velocity in ACA and this kind of uh, signature in MCA, the, uh, there is some problem in the MCA. By this time, the MR gantry was ready, we did an MR. And there is a small restricted diffusion. This is the low ADC. This, the GRE picks up the, there's a clot here, and this is the immune occlusion. So remember, it's already beyond uh, four, four, five hours, whatever. And we also did an MTT map. There's a huge perfusion deficit. So there is a huge mismatch. So by this time we completed the MR, the patient was almost, I mean, resolved, almost. And soon after the MRC worsened. So by this time we know very well what is happening inside the brain. So we did not wait, we gave her IVTP, right away, and took her to the lab. And again, 2008, no strain retriever, no penumbra, so it was only IATPA. So we gave her IATPA. And this is the IATPA given. It's not, everything was recanalized. There is some residual thrombus over there, but we could achieve a good flow over the hemisphere in the MCA territory. And then he did a TCD soon after the lab. And the MCA opened. And she started improving quickly. So, after two days, he's almost normal. So, the take home message for my younger colleagues as well is you can take the bull by the horn, but exercise caution, understand the mechanism very well, what you are going to do, upfront discussion with the family, all cards on the table, consent, and go ahead. And all those cases we have done then and even now, uh, you will get a consent in 99.9% .9 cases, if not 100. So take them on the same page and do it, but don't mess with the bull. 
you might get a horn. And believe me, it hurts. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Dr. Call wants to say something? Yeah, Jen, great talk. I only one comment. It's a comment, it's not yes, a question. Please. Uh, this minor stroke should not be thrombolizing if it is non-disabling. This is very subjective. Yes. I, I think all strokes, howsoever minor, are disabling. In fact, I used to think, I mean, what is, if, if you've got a left-hand weakness, it's also disabling. Even if it is minimal weakness and you are not able to button your shirt, it's also disabling. The only thing I thought may be non-disabling is there's a sensory phenomena. But you remember the lacunate stroke uh, in thalamic patients? They curse us. So I don't think, it's very vague. I think we should thrombolize all strokes and say that it was disabling. Absolutely. And I always add that line that patient disable in that view of the treating physicians. If the patient has got a hemianopia, that's a disability. If the patient has got a hand drop, especially the dominant hand, is a disability. It may be NIH3, it may be NIH4. So you cannot, you cannot thrombolize anybody who is contraindicated. But now the, the guidelines, the 2019 EHA guidelines, has put a lot of category into what is called as additional recommendations. In additional recommendations, the neurologist can see and weigh the risk of the stroke and the risk of the complication. Here you can, like dementia, yes. MRS, previous more than two, yes. Diabetic uh, proliferative retinopathy, yes. But then you have to look at the stroke also. Here you have to take a beyond guideline. The consent, we all have routine consent forms. It doesn't say beyond guideline. I think we should change that also because of this additional recommendation and say, we are thrombolizing beyond guidelines, and that should, I think that is what is going to save medical legal issues. That is very important. So, so one question, yeah. uh, some insights about thrombolysis in central retinal artery occlusion. Uh, well, is it uh, like, uh, of course, is there, it is no on or, yeah. there is no RCT on that. There is no RCT on that. But there are uh, publications that people have given um, selective intraarterial TPA, given IV TPA in all the conditions. but. I believe, I mean, even in my experience, I have treated only two patients. The result was not good. And there might be, might be some publication bias on that. People might not have published their cases where they failed. But, you know, I mean, if this is an atherothrombotic occlusion, I do not know how this TPA is going to help much in this small artery. So in my experience, the result is not that uh, encouraging. ophthalmologists. So if they, if they reach an ophthalmologist, they will do pressure and vitre vitrectomy, you know, to release the clot. But I think it's much because how can you open a clot just by doing a vitrectomy or by eye massage? That's not so, so I don't think ophthalmologists should be treating uh, CRO and the only way that CRO should be treated is by IVTPA, even though it's not guideline, but that's the best way to treat. So we should not allow ophthalmologists to do a vitrectomy. I am inviting Vineet to the stage now. We can have more discussion later. Uh, as you have seen, I have known him for the last 30 years in neurology. And the way he has taken neurology so seriously, you will learn from what he speaks is going to be a mixture of experience and academics. And uh, other things, he is an alumni of UCMS GB Panth, and a lot of articles, book chapters, and He's all those who attended Indian Stroke uh, Congress in Delhi, Indian Stroke Association meeting in Delhi, know that he's a good organizer as well. And right now also he holds post of Delhi Met Neurological Association president, Vineet. And we will have discussion after all the presentations also. Thank you, Dr. Anand. And uh, can I have the slide? No, this is not the first slide. Okay. So I think uh, I must congratulate Dr. Atmaram for, for conducting an excellent meeting and for giving me a very simple topic. I can actually stop the talk in one slide, but I'm not going to do that. So the talk given to me was DOACs in lone atrial fibrillation. So now what is lone atrial fibrillation? Lone atrial fibrillation is atrial fibrillation 
which occurs below the age of 60 years. There is no associated cardiovascular or pulmonary condition and no hypertension, diabetes. So a CHATS2 VAS score would be zero. Less than 60, no cardiac, no hypertension, no diabetes, CHATS2 VAS score is zero. So what do we do? No DOAC. So there is no oral anticoagulation required. So I can actually stop my talk there. You know, in, in low natal fibrillation, there is no need for DOACs. But then I requested Dr. Atmaram to, you know, to change my topic and then I removed the loan from there. So now my talk is going to be on DOACs in, in atrial fibrillation patients. And I think that is where we all run into trouble. So you have a 130 kilogram patient with atrial fibrillation. Which drug, which DOAC are you going to use? You have somebody who's post liver transplant with atrial fibrillation, which drug to choose? You have somebody who has a seizure disorder and you now has atrial fibrillation, which drug to choose? So it's, it's, a, it's a major issue for the neurologist to be running into all of this. So that's what is going to be in my talk that, you know, how do you decide which patient and which anticoagulation to be used? So the first four questions when you see somebody with atrial fibrillation is, does the patient have atrial fibrillation? So what is atrial fibrillation? Second, if there is AF, then what is the indication to use a DOAC? Third, what is the timing? When should you start the DOAC? And if you have to now start, which DOAC to use? So we all know atrial fibrillation is an irregularly irregular rhythm because of fibrillating atria and there are no discernible P waves. Paroxysmal AF is when it reverts by treatment or otherwise within seven days. Persistent AF is where it lasts for more than seven days. Long-standing AF is where it lasts for more than 12 months. Permanent AF is where you cannot revert it at all. Valvular AF is where there is either a valve replacement or there is more than moderate to severe stenosis. Now, the other definition that one should know is clinically apparent AF. So somebody presents to the triage with palpitation and you find an ECG. So it's symptomatic patient with AF. But very often you will see device detected AF. You have done a pacemaker evaluation or an ELR and you find AF and only 10 beat, 3 beat AF. Would you consider that as AF or secondary AF? Somebody has been admitted with sepsis and develops a brief AF. Would that be also taken into accommodation as, and would you like to anticoagulate these patients? So the guidelines say whether it is persistent or paroxysmal, whatever be the duration of AF, anticoagulation is required, even if it is secondary AF. And even atrial flutter, which is a much more uh, rhythmic uh, arrhythmia, also needs uh, anticoagulation. So whatever be the duration, even if it's a three beat, four beat, because AF increases with time, so you would anticoagulate these patients. Only if you have a chats to ask one, then the timing of the AF is important. You need more than 30 seconds of AF documentation. When to anticoagulate? What is the risk stratification? Go on to the CHADS2 VAS score. And if your CHADS2 VAS score is zero, like I said, low NAF. So now you have only CHADS2 VAS score of zero, no anticoagulation. If your CHADS2 VAS score is one, then you may only anticoagulate if your has blood score is less than two. Patient has atrial fibrillation and not flutter. The atrial fibrillation is persistent, not paroxysmal. The LA volume, the left atrial appendage, the left atrium is more than 4.7 centimeters or the volume is more than 73 ml and the left atrial appendage emptying pressure is less than 20. Otherwise, you do not anticoagulate somebody with a CHATS2 VASC 1. But CHATS2 VASC 2 and above is where you will anticoagulate. So this is one one should remember. So CHATS2 VASC 2 and above in males is where you will anticoagulate. When to anticoagulate? The rule of the European Heart Rhythm Association, the rule of 1, 3, 6, 12. 1, if it is a TIA. 2, 3 days, if it is a minor stroke. If it's a moderate stroke, you, you start the anticoagulation after day 6. Severe stroke after day 12. If the patient has suffered an intracranial hemorrhage, apart from lobar hemorrhage, you will anticoagulate uh, after 28 days. And if the patient has had a subarachnoid hemorrhage or a subdural, which has been treated, then one to two months later, you can start the anticoagulation. And there are some trials, Elan, Optimas, and timing, which are actually ongoing to identify the timing, best timing. But till then, the 1, 3, 6, 12 rule should be followed and the 28 for ICH. Then once you have decided that, yes, this is AF, you have decided that the CHATS2 VAS score is in favor of anticoagulation. Now comes the question, which one to use? Would you use a VKA? Would you use warfarin? Or do you use a, a DOAC? 
so the the advantage of doax is that they are they act only directly they are called doax because they act directly dabigatra non thrombin and the anti factor 10a only on factor 10a warfarin acts all over the uh, pathway on factor 2 7 9 10 protein cell so it's a it's it's a much more uh, broader uh, ma management and till 2010 it was warfarin which was ruling the roost you know there was no other drug you could, but after that there were four pivotal trials the relay trial the uh, rocket af the apixa the apixa band trial aristotle and the engage trial which have actually you know off seated warfarin what the meta analysis of more than about 60000 patients what did it show that when you use a doac the risk of intracranial hemorrhage is reduced by 51% the risk of major bleeding reduces by 14% the risk of stroke reduces by 19% and all cause mortality goes down by 10% only the gi bleed increases so when you use a doac the risk of bleeding intracranial and major bleeding is almost like aspirin so it's a much much be better advantage that if you have to choose between warfarin and doac you would choose a doac unless and until there are certain indications where you would so the guidelines say that patients who have atrial fibrillation who do not have moderate to severe mitral stenosis or mechanical valve doac is recommended in preference to warfarin but does warfarin still have a place yes so warfarin is used where you have a mechanical valve or patients who have moderate to severe ms a bioprosthetic valve anti phospholipid antibody syndrome cld with a child puck c i'll we'll discuss that and ckd5 this these are only now indications where warfarin is preferred over doac most other situations you would use a doac now how do you choose between the doacs also are all the doacs the same so you need to see that you know you so you have to tailor make the therapy based on 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 the doac how do you tailor make so you basically go back on to pharmacokinetics look at the pharmacokinetics of the drug which is excreted through the liver which is excreted through the kidney which has a pro drug so you decide on that basis and look at the data from the pivotal trials these four pivotal trials just look at the data which drug was more efficacious in which condition and you can then select based on that and then you also have registries and real world data registries so you can uh, take data from there now if you look at the pharmacokinetics pro drug there is only one drug dabigatran which is a pro drug and the problem with dabigatran is it needs mucosal esterases to convert it into the active drug so anybody who has gastric resection gastric bypass or gi disease there is less mucosal esterases to convert dabigatran into the into the active drug so be careful in post gastric uh, bariatric surgery patients renal clearance maximum dabigatran 85% so you cannot use in ckd patients and uh, liver metabolism the advantage is dabigatran is not affected by cytochrome p450 so this would be the advantage in epileptic patients or in patients who have other drugs which are cytochrome p450 uh, metabolized if you look at the pivotal trials the relay trial for dabigatran showed that the 150 mg dosage has the maximum superiority so if you need a real effective dose in a stroker somebody who's had two strokes three strokes even on warfarin and you need the best and the most efficacious uh, doac then it is dabigatran at 150 mg triple therapy if you need for short term somebody who's been stented and af and the data for triple therapy for using aspirin clopidogrel and a doac only the data exists for for Uh, uh, dabigatran so in these two situations high stroker triple therapy dabigatran for patients who have very high chats to score rivaroxaban has data more than 3.5 chats to rivaroxaban actually had the best data and safety data is the best for apixaban least amount of major bleeding in the gi and the brain so the best data for uh, bleeding is with apixaban and engage and the Uh, rocket uh, the the rivaroxaban and engage are the od doses that you can use and then there were a lot of uh, registries also which almost showed that uh, data of the efficacy of the uh, pivotal trials so this is based on efficacy a high stroker dabigatran 150 mg is the one you'll choose if there is a high bleeder somebody who has a very high, high has blood score 3 4 has blood score then a pixaban is the drug to be chosen if rivaroxaban somebody with high chats to vas score so this is how probably you can look at the efficacy profile to choose 
safety profile to choose. Now we come to certain medical conditions and look at these subgroups. So somebody who has artificial heart valves, we've already discussed that you use VK. So artificial heart valves or somebody who has a moderate to severe mitral stenosis, only VKA. In, in CKD, so if you have CKD uh, 5, that is the patient is GFR less than 15, only warfarin was used, but now there is data from the renal AF trial that apixaban can also be used. So now in CKD5, you can use either warfarin or apixaban. And for patients who are post-transplant patients who are on tacrolimus and cyclosporin, the data is only for, for apixaban. So post-transplant patients, renal transplant patients, data for apixaban, CKD5 dialysis patients, either warfarin or apixa, no other drug. And dabigatran is contraindicated even in CKD4, which is 15 to 30 GFR. So coming to CLD, calculate the child and PUC score based on the bilirubin, albumin, ascites, encephalopathy. If the patient has a child PUC score of A, you can use any of the drugs in early CLD. Patients with child PUC B, you uh, do not use rivoxaban. And child PUC C, you, you have to use only warfarin. You cannot use any other agent in that age group. Now, since the DOACs are not weight related, you have only one single dose, apixaban 5 milligram BD, uh, dabigatran 150 milligram BD. Now, if you have somebody who is less than 40 kilos or above 120 kilo, here there is a problem by using the same dose because if you are using on a 40 milligram a high dose, the patient may bleed. And if you are using on a 130 kilogram, then it may, so basically it is recommended that patients who are more than 120 kilos, less than 40 kilo, it is better to use warfarin. Use a DOAC only if you can do DOAC plasma levels. So monitor plasma levels in these patients. Otherwise, it is better in these low body weight or high body weight patients to use a VK where you can monitor it with the prothrombin time. And for elderly, for above 90, the data is only for apixaban. In the Aristotle trial, there was data to suggest that apixaban actually fared better. Even world, uh, the registry also shows that for elderly, the DOACs are better than the uh, than uh, VK and the maximum safety data is for again for apixaban uh, for the elderly. Now this is again in like we discussed in GI symptoms. So the problem with dabigatran is two problems. Dabigatran, like I said, because it is absorbed in an acid pH. So the capsule is mixed with tartaric acid to reduce the acid pH. And tartaric acid is a major irritant to the stomach. So a lot of patients who have acid peptic disease, a lot of gastric symptoms, uh, dabigatran is very, very not tolerated by them. It's a difficult drug to tolerate. And the other is because it's a pro-drug, it needs mucosal esterases to convert into active drug. So you cannot use it for patients who have had a gastric bypass or an esophageal resection. And you cannot use it through the Riles tube. You cannot give a patient uh, dabigatran through the Riles tube. So if you have a, these conditions, then again, apixaban is the drug of choice for patients with resections. The rivroxaban has now a new indication, an FDA approved indication based on the COMPASS trial. So some of your patients who have had, who are on an antiplatelet, but they are recurrently getting strokes and you're not finding any other cause. So you can use rivroxaban 2.5 milligram with aspirin as an add-on for patients with stable disease. And there is a more than 24% risk reduction for stroke with a 1.7 times increase in bleeding. But you, in some patients back to the wall where you're getting recurrent strokes despite antiplatelets, you can't do any intracranial stenting. There is one indication now for rivroxaban also to be used along with aspirin in a small 2.5 milligram dosage uh, based on the COMPASS trial. And there is a 2018 FD approval for, for this usage as well. Now, this is, I think, for all the neurologists, a very important thing that, you know, you have an epileptic patient. And so what are the problems of epilepsy patients with AF? You know, because these patients on DOAC, if they develop head trauma, they'll develop subterior hematoma, they may bleed from the tongue from a tongue bite. And then you are using a lot of enzyme inducers and enzyme blockers. So which drug to use? If you have to use the DOAC, the DOAC is dabigatran because it is not affected by cytochrome P450. So if there's an epileptic patient, you have to choose a DOAC, use the dabigatran. And if you have to use the uh, anticonvulsant drug, the anticonvulsant recommendation is either brivaracetam or lecosamide. I was also surprised to see that liveracetam also interferes with the DOAC. So it reduces the efficacy of the DOAC 
and there have been reports of bleeding uh, because of uh, usage of levetiracetam along with a DOAC. So levetiracetam actually by the European uh, Heart Rhythm Association, levetiracetam is out to be used so, and basically one has to use either eslicarbazepine, lacosamide or brevacetam. So I think that is one thing that one should keep in mind. Use these as the anticonvulsant and preferably use dabigatran as a DOAC in this group. Then in patients with cancer and atrial fibrillation, this was actually an exclusion criteria for all the pivotal trials. But then there are some open registry and meta-analysis of trials which have shown that the DOACs are better off than the VKs even in these patients. And DOACs can be used in patients who have underlying malignancy, are undergoing treatment, radiation, chemo and others, and have atrial fibrillation. So one can use DOACs rather than VK. Patients, this is the other question that we sometimes come across, thrombocytopenia. Patients have a platelet count of 70,000. We are not using an antiplatelet, obviously, because, but can a DOAC be used in that situation? Patient has atrial fibrillation. So, can, so the data suggests that if the platelet count is less than 20,000, don't use a DOAC. Between 20 to 50,000, you may use a DOAC with care, but above 50,000, there is data from the Aristotle trial, which did not have a contraindication if the platelet count was more than 50,000. So there is enough data that if the platelet count is above 50,000, a Pixaban in a low dose 2.5 milligram can be used in thrombocytopenic patients also. So sometimes you have a malignancy patient who has a low platelet count because of chemo and AF. So even if the platelet count is more than, we would not use an antiplatelet at that dose. But definitely we can use a DOAC. There is data to suggest that we can use a Pixaban in a low dose in that. Then gastric bypass patients, like I said, avoid dabigatran and one can use. The other thing that we should keep in mind is also if these patients come to you with a bleed, then you need also how to reverse. It's very simple with the VKA, with warfarin, just give them FFP, just give them a PCC and you can reverse. But the problem is that with dabigatran, uh, adaruzumab is still available. You can give five gram uh, intravenous immediately and basically one does a thrombin time. If the thrombin time is more than 60 seconds, there is effect and you can do reversal by using adarizumab. But the problem is with factor 10A inhibitors because adnexate alpha is not available. And uh, the dose that is used is a bolus of 400 milligram followed by 4, 480 milligram over two hours or 800 milligram followed by 960 milligram for two hours depending on when the DOAC has been taken. So this, there is a problem. So somebody who's coming from say Meerut or somebody from a distant place and you know, he is to be given an anti doac then probably a VKA may be much better because at least FFP is available probably everywhere. But if you have somebody in the, in the, in the city, then probably that is where you would like to choose which, which agent to choose. So I think the last slide here, so if you want a efficacy, so basically where is warfarin now used? Warfarin is used for artificial valves, moderate mitral stenosis, bioprosthetic valve, CLD, child PUC, C, CKD5, and APLA syndrome. Efficacy, dabigatran 150 milligram. Safety, apixaban, OD dose, rivaroxaban, and endoxaban. That is from the pharmacokinetics and the safety profile. CKD, either use apixaban or warf. CLD, warf, and you can use the others in uh, child and PUC A and B. GI bleed, apixaban. Elderly, apixaban. Obesity, less than 40 or more than 120, warfarin. Stable uh, cardiovascular disease, recurrent strokes, you can use rivaroxaban with low-dose aspirin. Triple therapy, the data is for dabigatran, like I said. High chats to vascore, rivaroxaban. Cancer and AF, DOAC is better. Epilepsy, choose dabigatran and brevaristam and lacosamide. Low platelets, apixaban. Gastric bypass, VK. And based on availability, I think it would be either dabigatran or warfarin. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Suri, for the excellent lecture and making us very clear about the choice of NOAC in AF. Any comments and queries from audience? Thanks for a very, very good lecture. Uh, my surprise was about levetiracetam, as you pointed out, but isn't lacosamide uh, a point of concern that you, that could be conduction defects when you're dealing someone with atrial fibrillation? And lacosamide is contraindicated. I think we have to look at the guidelines and then we have to choose somewhere in between on our own. You know, so basically this is, one should know that the guidelines, so we all use levaracetam. 
and i think uh, locosamide we've not had much of a problem with conduction except maybe for one or two patients where we've had some pauses but i think the, the entire neurology group is here i don't think locosamide causes that much of problem but yes there is an issue so with atrial fibrillation when you have somebody on locosamide and you have pauses then you'll immediately think of a six sinus syndrome and you know you'll get worried that whether the patient needs a pacing but locosamide would be one of the causes there we all used we all use levetiracetam but you know if we look at guidelines then the 2021 european um, uh, uh, rhythm uh, association guidelines uh, they say that you know levetiracetam there have been three papers which have shown that either it is associated with excessive bleeding or lower effect of noac and you have to do plasma levels of the noac when you have got your patient out so we should be aware of that but i think we all tend to use levetiracetam and the doac Uh, again about uh, brevaricetam uh, is good with partial seizures but what happens with G gtcs uh, patients who have generalized epilepsies i'm not talking about the igs there i think again we would uh, brevaricetam may not be the drug of choice it can't be used less than 16 years of age we don't have guidelines with it's not approved for use so these are seniors. these are guidelines from the, the gray areas. from the arrhythmia society so they are not experts on the on the anti convulsant you know but they they have submitted their data of safety for usage of the doac so i think we have to give them that and then we choose uh, on our own basis we choose the drug that we feel is important yeah sir a few patients in holter report they have this paroxysmal atrial tachycardia which is reported so should we treat it like an atrial fibrillation or no pat should not psvt should not be because you see what so not ps uh, Uh, yeah proximal atrial tachycardia and paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia are the same so you see what happens is that you have to give it you have to look at it and the entire thing in the sense that some patients may present to you with atrial fibrillation where now there is a clear cut indication but before atrial fibrillation a lot of patients may have an atrial cardiomyopathy and atrial fibrillation is probably the final drop in the bucket to tilt the balance so if your patient has proximal supraventricular tachycardia or proximal atrial tachycardia but there is atrial cardiomyopathy the atrial cardiomyopathy in the sense that the left atrial diameter is more than 4.7 cm your left atrial appendage emptying time is more than 20 or your volume of the left atrium is more than so now you have a atrial cardiomyopathy there even if it is a paroxysmal atrial tachycardia or even if you have short runs i think this patient you can't monitor all the time so this is the patient who deserves to be given the anticoagulation but somebody who has a left atrial appendage diameter of you know, left atrial append uh, atrium of 3 cm a short run of psvt obviously there is no atrial cardiomyopathy then you can just follow these patients on rhythm, on rhythm monitoring sir uh, sir what are the recommended doses of doax in for dvt prophylaxis what are the DVT? Uh, recommended doses of yeah. so the recommended DVT doses for for dvt prevention doses is much lower like for epixaban it's 2.5 bd half. and for rivaroxaban it's 10 mg mod so it's almost like half the dosage for dvt prevention dvt treatment is almost the same in fact for dvt treatment the first 7 days is a higher dose even like for epixaban then not 5 mg bd it's 10 mg bd for first 7 days then followed by the 5 mg bd So prevention is 2.5 milligram BD for a pixaban, 150 milligram BD for dabigatran. So that kind of a dose, unless until the patient is age above 80, has a weight less than 60 or a creatinine more than 1.5, where the dose criteria will come in. Uh, I have personally not used. I still prefer to use the VKs in that, but there is data. from rivaroxaban band so there are there is enough data now to suggest that the doacs also do e easily well it's not guideline but there are definitely large number of uh, literature support saying that you can use and the maximum data support is for rivaroxaban band so is there is there one drug prefer over the another drug in that scenario i think as of now i would still put sinus venous thrombosis vka better than doacs So, if you have a contraindication for VK, then go for DOAC. And between the DOACs, I don't think there would. But if you look at literature, so because there is more literature for the rivaroxaban, so I think it, it's always best to you know be going along with the literature rather than you know trying to be like you know taking the bull by the horn. So, Vinit, this um, this as far as the paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is concerned, you said that now we need not bother about 
the duration and the, because those used to be criteria. It should be minimum 30 seconds and it should happen at least twice a week. Now that has, that's a passe now. So uh, see, uh, if I if, uh, I'd actually made out on that my slide that it's a gray zone. And now the, because the initial data was that atrial fibrillation device detected. Some studies used more than 30 seconds, some used more than six minutes. But now the, the AHA guidelines of prevention of stroke 2021, they also mentioned that the duration in, spent in AF is not important. Although they mentioned this is a gray zone because this needs to be studied. And only in CHATS2 VASC 1 is where you will apply this criteria. Otherwise, if you have AF, these patients over a period of time, because AF is, there is already an atrial cardiomyopathy. Once a patient, so atrial cardiomyopathy goes, 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 becomes worse, worse, and then atrial fibrillation happens. So by the time you have atrial fibrillation, the atrial cardiomyopathy has already set in. So whatever be the duration, so this is the thought process. There is guidelines, but I think only if you have a very low chats to ask, like just uh, age 70 and uh, low AF and uh, just brief duration, that's where probably you will, you may take your decision of not anti or not anticoagulating. So, uh, what about the cases of atrial flutter with the uh, variable blocks? Yeah, atrial flutter is now, like I said, atrial flutter is now not to be differentiated, even though atrial flutter is a much more rhythmic beat, but uh, it is very clear that the, all these are indicative of an underlying atrial cardiomyopathy evolving. So, atrial flutter or atrial fibrillation, you will go ahead. The only distinction is atrial, if you have CHATS2 VASC1, in CHATS2 VASC1, you will not do it unless until you have persistent AF and a has blood less than 2. So we Chats, don't... If you have, have chats to ask 2 and above, whether it is atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, persistent, paroxysmal, whatever you will do, chats to ask 1 is where you will think. So we need the moment the patient has come to neurology, it is not 1. The score is more than 1. Yes. So any patient with a we don't get patient who have asymptomatic AF, the bait is there. So I think if you happen to have an asymptomatic AF, then it becomes one or zero for this thing. So one of the president of, uh, I think, Stroke World Stroke Association said, why are we doing Chad West for neurology patient? Because our every patient who has AF of any duration will qualify for anticoagulation. No, but I think very often we see patients being treated by the cardiologist. They've picked up uh, on a halter. Uh, AF and the patient is like 65 years of age, patient is running on dual antiplatelet and we are more worried about the stroke because the cardiologist is not worried about the stroke at all. He says cardiac rhythm is fine, I will put you on yeah. a beta blocker, that is fine. Yeah, that but is as neurologist, the minute I see somebody, he's come to me with headache but he's also carrying a halter report saying there is AF. So, you know, as cardio as neurologists, we are more worried to prevent the stroke and it is our responsibility to prevent stroke. So Cardiologists is not worried about stroke. They are yeah. worried about... So, we can move on to rehab now. So, but uh, even those patients will have chad West score of more than one because yes. he has come from cardiology and on dual. So, the moment a patient comes to neurology with any duration of AF will require this thing. If he has come from cardiology, even then it will be this thing. So I, I think Bhavna will introduce uh, a person whom we need no introduction in last one year. He's been so prominent on all uh, platforms of neurology. So Bhavna, you formally introduce. So next talk is by Dr. Nemal Surya, in President, Indian Academy of Neurology. He will be delivering a talk on neuro rehab. Let me read his CV in brief. He is MD, DNB, and FRCP. His workplace is Bombay Hospital, Mumbai, Safi Hospital, Mumbai, and North Court Police Hospital, Nagpara, Mumbai. His special interests include epilepsy, stroke, and neuro rehab. His professional experience is vast. He is Chairman, Surya Neuro Center, Mumbai, Founder, Trustee and Chairman, Epilepsy Foundation, India. Okay, okay. I'll stop here. And <laughs> I think I need to deliver the lecture, Bhavna. So, he will so, introduce himself by his talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, my secretary is here and uh, I don't want to be embarrassed that Oh, you all know that I am the president of Indian Academy of Neurology and that is what is most important because uh, I am here as uh, one of the neurologists who is expert in the stroke to talk to you about the post-stroke rehabilitation 
a much, much forgotten uh, topic. Will technology be new savior? And uh, neurologists, the stroke expert, they are the real need to take lead. Uh, real progress in technology happens only when it becomes available to everyone. And that's what we really need to do. There are a lot of concepts from recovery uh, from stroke and uh, what are the future perspective and why I brought this slide is to highlight that look at the stroke. Disability adjusted life here worldwide and you look at stroke for all ages and you know that straight away that stroke is problem not for the middle age or elderly but for everyone and therefore uh, there is a critical time window for recovery which may extend beyond one year and I will come back to you on these points later on. So what are the new technology which uh, are available to us? And uh, you can have robotics, non-acute devices, FES, virtual reality, sensor technology, and the brain stimulation. The robotics are the one who assist, enhance, and intensify therapy. These are the devices such as body weight supported system which facilitate the rehabilitation. FES stimulate to create functional movement and improve the recovery and use of virtual reality and environment for enhancing the movement therapy. Sensors are for assessing and enhancing therapy. And finally, the computer brain interface, which is uh, going to be the major thing which in future. So these are the robotics, brain computer interface, sensory substitution, neuromodulation. And lastly, I'm going to talk to about uh, the tally rehabilitation, which is a new thing which has been adopted during this COVID pandemic. So conventional gait trainer does not restore a normal gait pattern in the majority of stroke patients. And robotic devices are increasingly accepted among many researchers and clinicians and are being used in rehabilitation for uh, various physical impairment, both upper and lower limb. These are some of the advantage because it is safe, intense, and task-oriented. Uh, precisely controllable assistance or resistance during the movement. Uh, there may be increased training motivation through the use of interactive biofeedback. As you are walking, you know that what speed you are walking, which muscle you are acting, so that motivates you. And uh, good repeatability and objective and quantified measure of subjective performance. So you can measure that last week I was doing this, this week I am doing better. These are the various advantages of robots in motor rehabilitation. Uh, the important thing is does reduces the cost because many times patients are heavy, you need four people, but with the help of uh, a robot, you can handle them. The precise doses, kinetic measurement, etc., are useful. They may replace the physical training effort of a therapist, allowing more intense repetitive motion and delivering therapy at a reasonable cost. I'm very doubtful about reasonable cost, but we are really come at a stage where we can affordably provide this. Assess quantitatively the level of motor recovery by measuring forces and movement pattern. So they can be exosuit or exoskeletal, and these are various uh, robots for the upper limb, you can have for the shoulder and elbow, you can have for hand robot, whole arm robot, ankle, ankle board robot, wrist robot, or anti-gravity. So you can have a robot or exoskeleton specific for the joint. And this one is very popular, Armio. It combines an adjustable arm weight support with a wide range of self-initiated functional and motivational exercises, uh, assessment tool for an accurate monitoring of patient rapid progress. And this is for arm. And then you have a specifically designed for patient with severe movement impairment who have no voluntary activation, but it can move. And equipment combined adjustable uh, ergonomic guidance, which uh, where motion, motor assists the patient so the patient, if not putting an effort, the, the robot helps them out to put the effort. The robotic th therapy for upper limb are being useful. And uh, we had this randomized control trial, moderate to severe upper limb impairment for six months, more after the stroke, intensive therapy with intensive comparison therapy and useful care. 
So the Cochrane Review report that patients who receive electromechanical and robot-assisted arm training after a stroke are more likely to improve than only arm motor function and generic activity of daily living. And I'll come back to that. We have a robotic talk in the later part of after this session, and you could use, uh, you know, get more information on that. So robotic therapy for lower limb. These are the robotic-assisted gait training. The commonest is locomotor. I'll come to that. Uh, they can measure the uh, improvement in Barthel scale, RMI, etc. So this is the Hakoma's uh, locomotor, which consists of robotic gait, orthosis, and an advanced body-supported system combined with a treadmill. And it uses computer-controlled motor, which are integrated in the gait orthosis, and drive are precisely synchronized with the speed of treadmill to ensure a precise match between the gate orthosis and the treadmill. So Lokomat is a very expensive machine, but it offers you something uh, particularly not only for stroke, but spinal cord injury and traumatic brain injury. Uh, these are the various uh, studies which shows that uh, three months after the stroke, there is a crossover trial and it has definitely helped people to get a pattern of the gate. There are innovating with the rehabilitation technology in the real world. And uh, these are some of the new things which has opened up. Uh, if you look at that, this is one of the setup uh, which is called now locomotor gym. And uh, here you could see that uh, various kind of uh, walking uh, things been uh, given to the patient. And these technology could be at one place if you want to develop a, uh, a proper setup, in advanced setup, in the rehab, then you can have upper limb devices, lower limb devices, general devices, and these can be used as commercial, though expensive, but these are some of the things which are very easily available across the world. FES is the new things, not very new, but FES is something which can restore various functions to persons with impairment, such as spinal cord injury, brain injury, and the stroke. It can be used to control skeletal movement, it restored reaching motion to patients with a high spinal cord injury. And with the aid of computer stimulation and trial and error, a stimulation pattern can be chosen for that particular patient. And this tuned uh, pattern for a single stereotype motion is representative of current states of FES system. And these are the two examples where FES is most useful. This is for the hand. A person with a wrist problem with finger flexion, if during the action you apply the FES, he opens the finger and holds the object and can use the hand. Similarly, a person with the difficulty in walking and not being able to clear the ground through the foot, if you time the FES properly, his foot will be stimulated and uh, he will be able to lift the leg making his walk smooth. So these are the two examples which are very, very useful. And there is a high effectiveness of upper limb functional FES after stroke for the improvement of ADL and motor function. And it is a promising therapy which will play a future, important role in the future. Let's talk about virtual reality. These are the various uh, pattern, head mounted, omnidirection, treadmill body, specialized sound, uh, there can be presence, consciousness, scanners for the gesture-based interaction, hepatic input sensory vests. So they can be immersive, non-immersive. So what are the non-immersive? The immersive VR, Oculus, Oculus Quest, uh, HTC Vive, and Pico Neo. So these are some of the method which can be used. So here's a patient who puts the Google, and then he goes into the space, and he, he is really into the virtual environment, and uh, he, he's able to work on that. Similarly, for gait, you can have various principles, neuroplasticity, motor learning, which are the working. So what are the principles? So advantage, I think, one minute, I'll just go back. So this video not working. So advantage of uh, virtual reality in rehabilitation of balance and gait, it seems to be more effective at improving dynamic balance than static balance, number one, both for chronic as well as for the acute stroke. And post-stroke study suggest that it is safe and improve balance and gait even after a recent episode of stroke. 
is developing rapidly, has a potential to improve balance, gait in neurological disorder. And what is more important thing is, there are a lot of companies who are coming with indigen, uh, indigenized virtual reality system. And this is going to be very, very cheaper in the future. So arm rehabilitation, again, you have principal working on the uh, neuroplasticity and motor learning. There's a task specific interactive game-based virtual reality system for patients with the stroke. This is the paper which was published. And uh, you could see that uh, this could be forearm movement, uh, uh, upper extremity control, endurance, speed, and accuracy. Then there may be goalkeeper game, underwater fire game. So these are various games which a person can play. Rehab master intervention was effective in patients with chronic stroke. And in addition to randomized control trial in rehab master plus OT, there's a great improvement in fugal Meyer assessment or modified bath analytics in the groups. There's a virtual mirror also is something new which is coming. And these are visual amplification of goal-oriented movement counteract required non-use in hemiplegic stroke patient. So what are these? These are modulation of movement is achieved by combining two methods, that is amplifying the amount of uh, movement and by attracting the direction of the movement toward the target position. So this is the function. And here is, you know, double movement which work and both the hands are being activated. So this gives a visual motor feedback of an executed movement, reinforce the desirability of selected action, thereby increasing its corresponding expected outcome and lowering reliance of substitution act. So goal-oriented movement application in virtual reality enhances the use of paretic limb in hemiplegic stroke patients. Brain-computer interface, this is something which is uh, future, is useful in patients with disability to provide an improved and functional life. It detects the activity in the brain, amplifies it, and feeds the information to a computer interface, and it is processed, decoded, and is used to communicate, uh, rehabilitate, and in control of assistive devices. So this is the future which is uh, going to work in the neuro rehab. These are the concepts. You have EEG, fMRI, NIRS, and there is a signal acquisition, processing, decoding, pattern analysis, and then control matching, which uh, help in rehabilitating BCI, communicating and assisting assistive BCI. So it can be invasive or non-invasive, and it can get seven type of signal, slow cortical potential, sensory-motor rhythm, pre-300, steady state visual evoke potential, error-related negative evoke potential, blood oxygen level, and cerebral oxygenation change. EEG can be controlling this, fMRI for the blood oxygen level, and NIR as NIRS for the cerebral oxygenation changes. So they can be read. They can be communicating BCI, which is useful in patients with loss of motor and communicating functional, including speech in brain stem stroke and locked in syndrome. So locked in syndrome is something which has been uh, worked by this communicating BCI. These are output of decoded cortical signal is transferred to communicate. It's used in control cursor or computer interface, and it detects the P30 event-related potential, and it preserves the, if patient with preserve eye movement, eye tracker in combination with the speech generation device can be used for further rehabilitation and training. Concept of rehabilitation is cortical network reorganization following a vascular event, as we all know, and this network reorganization results in reduced excitatory firing on the side of lesion leading to poor recovery. And on attempting control, a prosthetic device using BCI attached to paralyzed limb result in reorganization of the network. Future direction involve incorporation of assessing the kinetic movements, uh, such as force and torque and decoding to the cortical activity. They can be assistive devices for BCI, and these used to control the robotic arm to produce purposeful movement. And there are a lot of other things which are coming, particularly in the neurological clinic and consultation. Sensory substitution device, they have been studied in visual domain. These are non-invasive SSD. They are wireless revolution, and they download the program, and uh, they can be used. So these are some of the SSDs. They are obstacle avoidance, depth perception, motion detection, and reaching out to the objects and realize. So these are useful, and these are very, very complicated, but future would be uh, to have the retinal processes or auditory SSD representation which will cause the sensory interpretation and help the people to visualize. So this may be combination of processes plus SSD 
could be used for the reason. Then there are neuromodulation, which is something which is coming up. And I will go quickly to the, this could be invasive, like DBS, epidural motor cortex uh, stimulation and epidural motor cortex stimulation. And then non-invasive like RTMS, TCDS, and pair associative stimulation. So invasive versus non-invasive, and uh, which are uh, ipsilateral versus controversial uh, con control lesional. These are the no neuromodulation based on correction of interhemispheric balance, and they stimulate the injured cortex, inhibiting the healthy cortex. So these are stimulation through the RTMS, TCDS, or inhibition through the low frequency T TMS or cathodal TCDS. Transcranial man magnetic stimulation is repetitive, safe, painless technique, based on application of magnetic on the cortex via coil. And there's a pulse mode which has been done and the movement is being seen. So that's how exactly it's been done. And uh, these are consist of applying a series of uh, same intensity stimulation. And then the low frequency also has, there can be different frequency for the uh, RTMS and which can be modified. So it is effective. It has positive effect on motor recovery and low frequency may be beneficial than high frequency for the affected hemisphere. The important thing is this can be useful in the acute stroke as well as into the chronic stroke. So uh, it shows to be promissive tool for stroke rehabilitation, though we still need to do a lot of work for our Indian population. In India, the RTMS is much more useful, used by the psychiatrist for the various uh, psychiatric disorder like schizophrenia, obesity. We really neurologists need to gather and do the studies for the stroke. And these are about low frequency for aphasia. Aphasia, it is a wonderful therapy and uh, it can improve the aphasia even during the acute stage. And these are the various studies which shows and this is how it works in the stroke patient uh, uh, proven by the FM, fMRI that the new networking is being developed. These are transcranial direct current stimulation, which can be done both at cathode or anode, depending on the situation. And again, there is evidence that low to moderate quality of TCDS versus control to improve the ADL. So these are the various uh, reports which shows that uh, long-term effect of uh, direct, uh, direct TCDS in post chronic post-stroke aphasia has been useful. They are also used for, for the transcranial direct current for unilateral visual spatial neglect. And this is a this is new thing which is paired associative stimulation, and uh, they can be paired stimulation for recovery phase of patient patient recovery. These are mirror therapy, which is another new therapy which is coming up, and it has been a current prospectively is very very useful. One can try that, and this is one of the uh, study where a large number of patients, more than 3,800, has been studied, which shows that it improves the ADL as well as quality of life. And this is how it has been proven on fMRI that neurons do. Then there can be a mental practice or mental imaginary where patients imagine what their actions are doing. And this is, again, very useful. These are some of the wearable technology stroke rehabilitation toward improved diagnosis and treatment of upper limb function. These are various uh, wearable technology which can be used. And uh, tele rehabilitation is something which is coming up uh, during this uh, COVID time, it has become a major trust to help the patient. And uh, this would be a very useful for cognitive therapy, posture control uh, in the rehabilitation, and it helps people with home-based rehabilitation. These are some of the advantages, and these are some of the pitfalls. So to summarize, new technology, wherever available, should be used for better outcome. Regarding neurophysiological and motor learning technique, tailor-made therapy need to be considered. MDT is what needed for best outcome with every team member take his role effectively. Selection of the newer technology is very important. And finally, role of family and family-based rehabilitation should be given priority. Tele-rehabilitation will be future in country like India. Thank you very much for your patience here. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Nirmal Surya for such a comprehensive coverage of a topic which becomes most important after patient has been treated by the clinician. And uh, it definitely makes a difference in recovery process.
Uh, I thank all the speakers. We are dot on time. It's 4.30 and our session ends at 4.30. However, 4.30 to 4.45 is tea time. All those, if you are interested, we can have few comments or questions because every speaker has done great justice. Stroke is such a topic, every patient poses a new challenge. In fact, uh, all those who spoke about it, even tomorrow we'll have a patient where we'll have another question. Either we can uh, go for the tea and have discussion there, or if any one or two comment till the ceremony is being done. I have a question for Vineet. So, uh, it's a very important thing for dual therapy, triple therapy, because often since the time DOEX came and we became very aggressive, we started getting a lot of hemorrhages and we do get that. So when to stop triple, dual and when to go for single therapy, even in the brain, previously we had heart. I had a patient of carotid stenosis with stroke with AF. It was a minor stroke on dual antiplatelet, then stunting was done. When should I do stunting? And then the my interventionist stopped the uh, antiplatelet because patient might bleed. Patient was 80 years, that patient had a stroke again. So this is another point. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Vineet can take a full lecture, but in brief, if you can tell. Uh, I think very important practical aspect. So basically when we talk of triple therapy, we are talking of an anticoagulation and a dual antiplatelet. The recommendations are not more than one week. In fact, because a cardiologist wants the dual antiplatelet and they want the anticoagulation because patient has atrial fibrillation. So the situation will come when you have anti dual antiplatelet because patient has been stented and you want the anticoagulation to be started. The recommendations for triple therapy are actually one week. Maybe stretch it to one month. Beyond that, it is not guideline. Uh, now, dual is the basic issue. Now, if we look at the chance and the point trial, the two trials which actually said dual antiplatelets, and the third where we extrapolate from intracranial arterial disease is the SAMPRIS trial. So these are three where we say, okay, now dual antiplatelet, there is safety and there is efficacy. So the, the, uh, the chance set only for um, uh, 15 days and then the other is for 90 days. So basically SAMPRIS also 90 days. So safety for a dual antiplatelet is not beyond 90 days. The Ticaglor and Ecosprin, which has now come as, as the new block as dual antiplatelet, is to be used for 30 days. So aspirin clopidogrel maximum 90 days, aspirin Ticaglor for 30 days, but the rider is that they say that these are to be used for patients with minor stroke or less NHS less than seven or a TIE. TIE. So basically when you have a major stroke, you know, you're not guideline to use dual antiplatelet, but we all tend to use the dual antiplatelet because we are extrapolating that data. So, so all that is the, the guideline is aspirin ticaglot 30 days, aspirin clopidogrel for 90 days, triple therapy maybe 30 days. That, beyond that, no just. I think we may have plenty of questions. Uh, the, uh, so, uh, well, this is to maybe call to. Uh, we often see this rapid metabolizer, ultra rapid metabolizer of clopidogrel, CYP2C19, and all. The guidelines don't recommend it. Do you think we should do it? How reliable and how, how much can we rely on these labs? Uh, it's because I, I can tell you that in my practice, I have at least now about 20 25 patients. For one, they said clopidogrel not useful. Or they said you have to give a higher dose in ultra rapid metabolizer. So I had to give twice a day. The prosugral you can't use, there's nothing recommending it. So why do you think we should use it? No, there is no doubt that clopidogrel resistance is a reality in India, and cardiologists know that. And in cardiology, they do routinely also. It's a black box warning. But if you see the neurology literature, uh, it says that clopidogrel uh, resistance is there in Southeast Asia and all. But then they have done longitudinal studies and they found that they, had, they took two groups. The one in which they took all the decisions by doing these genetic analysis, the other one where they gave standard strict medical care and they found there was no difference. Therefore, even though there is, uh, I mean, the technology has to be much more refined. Otherwise, as of now, they are not recommending in the guidelines to do, to do it. Now I think 
uh, with with prasugeril coming in and ticaglor coming in now they are actually recommending to do a cyp2 c19 if you are putting your patient on long term clopidogrel so cardiologists so, use it very commonly but uh, i think that i think uh, all good things have come to an end okay one one last thing the prasugeril has a higher incidence of hemorrhage and so it's actually not recommended i thought uh, i have this uh, little thing to add about cra occlusion the common thing that we would think as practitioners is first thing demyelination and when they say it's painless loss of vision then you think cra occlusion i were three have thrombolysed three no effect at all ajanta <laughs> uh, very quick comment on dr calls topic uh, recently with the advent of this more genetics of moyamoya disease rnf213 gene is being detected in many moyamoya patients and it has been seen that this gene uh, the phenotypic expression of this gene is not limited to cerebral vasculature it is being seen in renal vasculature and other vasculatures so now uh, rnf213 uh, vascular spectrum disease is is another new thing is coming up so this focal arteriopathies can be a phenotypic expression of this spectrum disease where we can also find disease in other focal areas so they should be studied genetically to see whether they fit with this genetics so i'll end this session by saying what i heard in 2017 a and conference by a stroke neurologist in plenary session he says if you want to practice stroke you have to be 24/7 available and you have to be aggressive and it has become more true today with dr subhash kol telling us we have to treat jayanta telling us that even beyond guidelines everybody is talking in each individual patient you never give up because you might find some way out to salvage some cells in the brain and if you are not able to salvage then give it to dr nirmal surya he'll find out something to do with the patient who cells are damaged i actually will also tell you something which was told to me by a computer scientist in 2018 in a robotic lab in stanford i happened to no, visit that to place on a sunday and this computer yeah. scientist told me young boy he says the brain which you have learned is nothing they were doing a study with the stanford uh, people with neurology department he says what you call as speech area what you call as leg area it doesn't stay because when we are seeing patient moving actually so it is something else so that speaks for neuronal plasticity and now we know that is how the patient can recover and that is how every cell salvaged is salvaged second thing he told me was he showed me how robotics come into things so that again is coming true today and in fact with all the artificial intelligence being fed tomorrow you will have a stroke patient put on a computer where it will have all the parameters marked what are missing and it will provide by that robotic so that's an end to this session things are very exciting in stroke we can continue i think probably over even gala dinner but we have to end it today thank you everybody thank you the speakers uh, sticking somehow, to time <laughs> somehow i may agree with the uh, dr anand aggressive or anesthetic uh, uh, remedy should not uh, provide the uh, troublesome melody <laughs> right okay thank you sir because it is very difficult i thank all the dignitaries for sharing their knowledge and enriching our as well the post lunch session on vascular neurology has truly been an academic feast and definitely diverted all the blood from our stomachs to our brains now i think it is time that we take a break from this brainstorming session and we'll head for the tea break now and for those who wish to continue this uh, neurology fiesta and enrolled for eg workshop please go to hall ghi on first floor eg workshop shall begin at 4:45 pm okay thank you